Yeah, I know. People tell me I should have gotten the bigger pad, right? Um, I'm doing a little sketching here, preparatory to the video. You know, I'm quite sure that you, as I know, someone with chronic lung congestion, chronic cough, who's managing that with drugs of some sort, right? Asthma inhalers, anti-inflammatories, prednisone, etc. Well, today's video, I want to talk to you about that and perhaps how that might not be the best approach in all cases. I'm going to draw on about 35 years of a clinical experience with patients day in and day out. And, you know, we'll see if we can take a look at this a little bit different way. You know, lung congestion is no more necessarily a lung problem than is a leaky faucet the problem with a slow drain. So anyway, we'll take care of that in a second. First of all, Western medicine, right? Best in the world, correct? Yes, I agree 100%. For certain things, acute trauma, uh, injury, great life-saving surgeries, uh, life-saving drugs, amazing battlefield fixes, and, and things like that. You wouldn't want to be anywhere else. However, as far as wellness goes, not so much. We want to talk about that too. In fact, I want to read a quote from one of the early influencers of my stages of wellness philosophy of Dr. Majid Ali. Doctors spend their whole lives dedicated to alleviating suffering, yet when it comes to reversing chronic disorders, they have become impervious to the most elementary of ideas, that injured tissues heal with nutrients, and nutrients must be considered the most logical and natural therapy. I have often wondered why my colleagues in drug medicine cannot see this. And it's true, isn't it? The tools of Western medicine essentially are drugs and surgeries. When the only tool you have is a hammer, more or less the only problem you see is a nail. So like I say, Western medicine is wonderful, but not so much for wellness. So let me just go ahead and finish out this sketch quickly, and uh, we'll talk about a little physiology in just a second. Okay, folks, my representation is ready for prime time, uh, be that as it may. Normal physiology of heart and lung. I think we all realize the lung's main purpose, don't we? It is to somehow deliver oxygen to the tissues, to red blood cells in the bloodstream, which is then carried to every tissue in the body. The more oxygenation we have and the more efficient it's working, the healthier our cells are, therefore the healthier our tissues and the healthier we are. We breathe oxygen in through our mouth and our nose, which is sent down the trachea through the so-called windpipe to the lungs. The lungs now full of fresh oxygen need to deliver that somehow to the tissues. The heart here is made of four chambers. There is a connection, there's a big loop from the lungs through the heart. The heart pumps fresh oxygenated blood out through the tissues. The tissues use that oxygen for their normal physiology. As we know, carbon dioxide is produced as a byproduct, which is then sent up back through another pathway, the other side of the heart, back to the lung to pick up more oxygen. That's the simple down and dirty of the whole process. Now. The problem in Western medicine is we become so compartmentalized and so specialized that docs have sort of lost sight many times of the big system. In other words, it's like drop your liver off to room five and your heart off on the second floor and your lungs over here and we'll pick them all back up on Wednesday and everything's good to go. We need to start looking at the system in a more holistic way not separately functioning lungs and separately functioning heart and separately functioning spleen and all these things. In other words, there's an intimate connectedness between the lungs and the heart. We need to start 
taking a look at this more as an integrated system. Perhaps the cardial pulmonary unit. Nothing happens in the lung that does not affect in one way or another, positive or negative, the heart and vice versa. So I want us to start thinking about the whole, the holistic view of physiology, not the separate discrete parts. Let me just tune that in with a little different chart for you to, to take into consideration. Okay, so this is known as the functional health continuum. I want you to start thinking about everything on a sliding scale. If this end of the scale is 100% healthy, and this is 0% healthy, or death, uh, I think we can see that we are all on this continuum at some point in our lives, aren't we? We're hoping that the things we do in our daily life, and our lifestyles and diets, are things that tend to push us up toward that upper healthy end of the scale, right? What are the kinds of things that we want to avoid that maybe slowly spring us down this way? Well, of course, smoking, high sugar intake, um, and so forth. The list goes on. So if we can get this idea sort of cemented, we realize that everything is by degrees. Don't we have to slide fairly down this pathway before certain specific diseases are diagnosed? Whatever that might be. Here's a flu. Here's um, pancreatitis. Here's cancer. Okay? So what, what is in between these two points though? This is the area of functional health that we can affect. So when we're back to looking at this diagram here, think about the idea that perhaps um, there's difficulty in lungs because of some weakness in the heart. So let's talk about another thing called congestive heart failure. Has anyone heard of this? Well, it's interesting to note that this is the number one diagnosis in the Medicare aged patient who's hospitalized. Congestive heart failure, and I think it's a kind of a bad term, failure implies completely done, but uh, I think something like congestive weakness might be uh, more appropriate, less fear inducing. But at any rate, if the heart is pumping at 100% efficiency, the blood that passes through here, out the aorta, is pumped fully out on each beat, or at least 100% necessary on each beat, out to the tissues, etc., and there's a nice cycle going on. Assume that the left ventricle here is a little bit weak for whatever reason, but perhaps it's pumping only 98% rather than 100% blood with each pump. Well, you can see that there could be a little bit of a backup after a while over time that can move its way back into the pulmonary vein and actually congest the lung a little bit. What might that cause? A chronic cough might cause a chronic congestion in the lungs. Well, in this compartmentalized Western medicine world we talked about, this patient is seeing who? The pulmonologist, the lung doc. Why? Because he has a lung symptom. The lung doc does what? Let's cut those symptoms down with drugs. Asthma inhaler, um, prednisone, uh, anti-inflammatories of all kinds, anti inflams okay? And it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Lung congestion, let's take the, the uh, congestion out of the lungs, let's cut the inflammation down. But the real story many times, and I've seen it in my practice for 30 years, is a little bit of weakness here. Now, a major weakness in the uh, lungs pumping cap capacity shows up in here um, when you reach far enough down the line. We get that diagnosis of what? Congestive heart failure. However, what about in this gray area here? Not bad enough 
to cause the cardiology department or the cardiologist to diagnose congestive heart failure, but bad enough perhaps to cause a little weakness and back up into the lung. So this is what I was getting at earlier on. In my chiropractic practice with specialty in applied kinesiology for 35 years, I've seen over and over uh, patients treated with anti-inflammatories and such that we talked about for lung congestion that my functional testing through AK has found to really be a slight weakness in cardiac function. And many times we're able to get these folks off of their steroid drugs and so forth that are managing but not healing their chronic uh, congested heart issues. We know from Dr. Majid Ali that nutrients heal tissues. All right, before we wrap up, there's an awful lot more to this than, than I'm touching on here. But I guess we should talk a little bit about what to do to keep yourself out of this situation to begin with, because of course that's the, the best way to go. We know that all disease processes involve some measure of inflammatory response. Excess inflammation in the system, even at the very small cellular level, is present in, um, in heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, Alzheimer's, all of that stuff. So number one idea to keep in mind for long, healthy life is to do the things that we can do to manage inflammatory stress in the system. I don't mean drugs. I don't mean anti-inflammatories because there's always a downside to the drug side of things. We want the natural approach. It's the way Mother Nature intended us to live, and um, that's the real way to go and heal. What does that mean? Well, it means reducing inflammatory load from foods. Number one, I mentioned sugar, sugar, sugar earlier. Sugar is a terrible inflammatory product um, that's hugely overdone in our diets. Um, I forget how many hundred pounds we consume in a year per person. Is it a hundred pounds? Obviously causes trouble with downstream effects um, in the physiology in the area of diabetic problems, creating a situation where yeast can thrive, candida overgrowth, those kinds of things, digestive troubles, and so forth. I think right alongside that, in position B, might be grains in the diet, uh, especially wheat gluten. Wheat gluten is very highly inflammatory and creates incredible spikes in blood sugar. Again, all bad news. Um, we need to avoid things like hydrogenated fats, etc. What do we need in our diets? Good healthful fats, fish oils, olive oil, avocado, uh, certain nuts, uh, flaxseed oil, these kinds of things. Even, believe it or not, fresh, grass-fed butter is healthful. We need good salt in our diets. Yes, please refer to a book called The Salt Fix by Dr. James DeNicolantonio. I'll, I'll link it down below if you'd like. But I've been finding that uh, in my practice for 30 years as well. Most people, including and perhaps especially those with, with heart issues, um, get generally better when we start adding a little bit of broad spectrum salt in their diets. Heck, we evolved with salt in our diets. The Romans probably consumed 20 grams a day. Uh, beyond that, uh, exercise, diet, sleep, perhaps meditation, and deep breathing exercises, for instance. These bring the nervous system from a high uh, arousal state, a uh, so-called sympathetic state, to a more balanced, relaxed, uh, parasympathetic state. This is when we can heal. Fresh water, exercise, sleep, etc. We should try to maintain a, a diet based high in organic vegetables, some fruits. I also believe, and many studies back it up, that we should have some animal products in our diets as well. Um, that's a choice you need to make on, on various parameters and that's up to you. Uh, so at any rate, you, someone you love, mom, dad, gramps, with this kind of chronic issue, chronic cough, chronic congestion, lung clearing all day, those kinds of things, who is maybe on um, the drugs we've mentioned and the protocol we've mentioned, I think it would be a great idea and a small first step 
to try something like convincing him or her to remove sugar from the diet for, let's say, two weeks. Remove grains for two weeks. See if there's some change in those symptoms. If so, perhaps the amount of medication used can be dropped. Our goal, of course, in the end is to get off all meds, but it's difficult uh, to do in 21st century with people on average with four and five medications, um, uh, the likes of which are playing games with the nervous system and the organs and glands to a large degree. Um, at any rate, any questions, please leave them down below. Oh, P.S. I forgot. I wanted to give a shout out to a couple of books I think might be really helpful for you in your quest to uh, get deep into the wellness lifestyle. These are some of my favorites. Not all by any means. But number one, Grain Brain, Dr. David Perlmutter, great neurologist out of Florida. The Salt Fix, Dr. D. Nicolantonio, talks about the importance of salt in the diet and uh, how the government recommendations have been skewed for years uh, against salt. The backstory on that is the sugar industry paid big bucks as part of that assault against salt. No pun intended. Rishi Mushroom, Dr. Willard, I've mentioned it in another video. Phenomenal stuff. There were more than 2,000 studies published in the National Library of Medicine on the healing powers of great organic reishi mushroom. RDA, Rats, Drugs, and Assumptions. This is one of the early books I read by Dr. Ali, mentioned earlier. And another one for the library would be Undoctored, Dr. William Davis, cardiologist, author of the highly acclaimed Wheat Belly. Now let me read one last quote before we go from Dr. Davis, actually dedicated to all the readers who recognize that health is something achieved through individual effort and has almost nothing to do with doctors or the healthcare system. So with that, we'll wrap it up. And um, till the next one, yours in Vibrant Health, Dr. J. Have a great night.